Crash Bandicoot. One of the first well-made and highly successful 3D platformers to exist, the PlayStation Classic was not only a great advancement from a game design perspective, but it was also a technical marvel. And with the Insane Trilogy release imminent, what better time is there to revisit where it all started? Come and have a spin through Crash's development as we take a look behind the screens. Crash was not always a Bandicoot, nor was he even named Crash. Crash's original design by his creators Andy Gavin and Jason Rubin was in fact that of a wombat named Willy, who had a slightly bulkier appearance as well as a long tail with a fluffy end. The name was Goofy, and was never meant to be final. As Gavin put it, some marketing department would probably change it anyway. Crash's design is described by Rubin as 51% technical and visual necessity and 49% inspiration. Crash's orange colour was decided based on a list of colours of popular characters at the time, as well as what colours would look good on a TV in the 90s. Bright reds, for example, would tend to bleed on CRT screens. His colour is also the reason for the exclusion of lava levels, as the background colours would be too similar to Crash's own colour. A lava level did exist in the first demo of the game, but was removed shortly after for this reason. Crash's face is large so that his features would be discernible on the low resolution output of the PlayStation. He also wears gloves so that the motion of his arms would be visible, despite being the same colour as his body. The low screen resolution is also the reason that Willy the Wombat lost his tail, as something that thin would flicker on the screen. Crash Bandicoot was one of the pioneers of 3D gaming, but Naughty Dog did not stray far from the design tropes of 2D platformers, including things like bottomless pits and breakable blocks. Instead, Naughty Dog decided to experiment with simply turning the camera to view the level head-on rather than from the side, and jokingly named it the Sonic's Arse Game. Andy Gavin described the thought process as, What would a 3D character platform action game be like? Well, we thought, you spend a lot of time looking at Sonic's arse. Whilst being humorous, this was also a problem, as such a view is not the best way to present your character. This dilemma inspired Crash's multiple perspective gameplay. The game would start with Crash facing the screen, so the player knows what he looks like from the front. Then the game has a 3D level, where the player runs into the screen and is introduced to all the new 3D mechanics. Then there would be 2D levels, giving the player a chance to see Crash in a familiar 2D setting. Finally, there would be, as Jason Rubin puts it, the reverse of a Sonic Arts level, where the player runs towards the screen. These would become the infamous boulder levels. Wumper Fruit were added to the game to make the levels a bit less boring. The PlayStation could not handle showing many enemies on the screen at one time, since they were composed of too many polygons. For this reason, early levels felt bland and empty. However, Wumper Fruit are in fact 2D sprites, so many of these could be rendered at once to add a bit of life to the levels. Crates were then also added to make the levels even more interesting. If enemies had too many polygons, then what could be added that did not require many polygons at all? The answer, of course, is a cube. If you ignore any faces that face away from the camera, the highest number of polygons you need to render a cube is a mere six. After a fierce night of programming, crates were tested and the developers instantly knew they had found a hit. Crash Bandicoot was a technical marvel, boasting visuals so impressive that Naughty Dog were accused of being given secret libraries of code from Sony to make their game perform better than others. The simple truth is, though, that Naughty Dog's motto was, bite off more than we can chew, then figure out some crazy complicated way to make it work. They would often break Sony's development rules by not using their provided libraries, and instead programming their own bespoke, more efficient libraries to push the hardware to its limits. The game was designed around the PlayStation's limitations, and so the design is the reason that Crash Bandicoot's levels look so rich and vibrant. Trees, hills, and turns in the levels ensured that there was never too much being shown on screen at once for the PlayStation to handle. If a polygon was obscured by something like a fern or a bush, the game engine was smart enough to ignore that polygon entirely. If the developers ever had too many polygons on the screen, they could actually add in a bush to fix the problem. It also turned out that the PlayStation was particularly good at rendering untextured but shaded polygons. Because of this, it was decided that Crash would be untextured, but with a high enough polygon count that the details could be shown using just the colors of the polygons. As well as rendering faster, this had other advantages. The bright colors of Crash would pop out on the screen, and he also avoided the PlayStation's lack of texture perspective correction. The characters were also animated differently to most games. Rather than giving a character bones and moving them around, Naughty Dog animators instead moved individual vertices around to create Crash's exaggerated expressions. 
In an era where bone animations in games were primitive and characters were low poly, this made Crash stand out from the crowd as an emotive cartoon character rather than an emotionless video game mascot. Naughty Dog would use this technique to even greater effect later on in Jack and Daxter. The in-game camera moves on a fixed path through each level, so a lot of things could be pre-calculated before putting the game on the disc. 3D games need to calculate the correct order in which to render polygons on the fly. The PlayStation had no easy way to do that, but in Crash Bandicoot it didn't have to. The order could be pre-calculated as it would always be the same thanks to the fixed camera. Many similar shortcuts were taken to stuff Crash Bandicoot into the PlayStation's limited RAM. Some of these pre-calculations were so complex that it would take several hours for a single level to process, even when that was being distributed over 8 computers. These techniques managed to compress levels that were 128 megabytes in size down to a measly 12 megabytes. That's impressive. But the levels would then need to be dynamically loaded in and out to fit into the PlayStation's 2 megabytes of RAM. This would have to be done seamlessly to keep the frame rate stable, and the developers even went as far as controlling the physical layout of the bytes on the CD-ROM. A large file exists in the game that serves no purpose but to push the game's data to the outside of the disk. Since this area of the disk moves faster, data here could be read quicker so that everything could be loaded by the time Crash ended up there. Levels are split into tightly packed chunks that could be loaded in and out on the fly, with Andy Gavin estimating that data would be loaded from the disc 120,000 times through a full playthrough. However, the PlayStation's disc drive is only rated for 70,000 hits, but they kept this a secret from Sony. Variables in the code had to be reused and repurposed to save individual bytes of memory, and in the end, Crash Bandicoot fit into the PlayStation's 2,097,152 bytes of RAM with just 4 bytes to spare. Despite all of this space saving, there does remain some content on the Crash Bandicoot CD-ROM that goes unused, the biggest being an entire level. The level, named Stormy Ascent, was a hard-as-nails 2D platforming challenge, developed as an homage to the castle wall level in the game Wizards and Warriors, described by Andy Gavin as one of the most brutal and fun levels ever to grace platforming. Stormy Ascent was removed from the final game as it was too hard, and the developers did not have enough time to make it easier. However, it is still accessible through the use of a game shark code, and is fully functional. Also unused in the final game are some extra obstacles in the boulder levels, a guard dog enemy, and an additional branching path in the level Castle Machinery. The final piece of unused content of note are two fully animated cartoon cutscenes, one for the game's intro and another for the game's ending. They feature some rather cheesy music, and were cut from the final game in place of 3D cutscenes, as Sony wanted to show off the power of the PlayStation. And there you have it, a brief history of the design, development, and technical innovation used by Naughty Dog to create their 1996 hit, Crash Bandicoot. What are some of your favourite Crash memories? Leave a comment below, and consider leaving a like and subscribing if you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching.